Okay, uh, thanks for coming. Uh, I'm going to make this as interactive as possible. So, um, you know, that's it. I believe that most of the stuff, if you Google enough, you can probably find it. So the only thing is uh, whether, how do you apply in a real life uh, clinical situation. Just a quick uh, take on local epidemiology. Uh, we did a rough audit of KK pediatric accidents, unintentional poisoning, sorry, for their own nomenclature. So in a very short five years, we had a 1,600, which is not a lot. 80% are obvious less than six years old because they tend to explore more. Uh, contrary to popular beliefs, slight like female predominance. Uh, okay, so uh, top agents of pediatric poisonings. Uh, again, number one is paracetamol, uh, salbutamol, and most of the fairly benign. Uh, some TCM as well, and medicated ointments. Uh, of note, naphthalene, silica gel, and detergent are also fairly common as well. Approximately half were admitted. Uh, ICU admissions involves antihypertensives, uh, low motil. Uh, Lomotil, do remember that diphenoxylate is actually an opioid, so, um, and it, it can cause opioid poisoning as well. And the problem is that the liver uh, changes it to diphenoxin, which is actually long-lasting, much than the parent, uh, uh, the parent drug. So other stuff are like metacilicylate, paracetamol poisoning, uh, TCA split design, uh, and high D is uh, the sulfonyl urea, phenothiazines, and uh, various components. Okay, but What's the difference between adult and children? So why do children get poisoned? The, the, epi, the epidemiology is also not just different because of age group of why they get poisoned. First of all, again, children are looking for new things that imitate new parents, they're learning to walk, they're exploring. And of course, they put things in their mouth. Uh, second, of course, uh, often we say that there's uh, insufficient childproofing. If you have those little little, little, uh, little, little uh, tablet for Monday, Tuesday, Wednesdays. If you leave it on a table, that's asking for it pretty much. Uh, again, as mentioned, uh, as, as you know, like, most of these are thankfully benign, but uh, it's not impossible to see why children get poisoned as well. And of course, we are partly to blame as well. Uh, <laughs> thank you. No, because we tell them that, look, uh, this is strawberry, this is strawberry syrup, this is uh, orange syrup if you are taking ibuprofen. Uh, then we tell them lies, that this is... So imagine if the child believes you, and when they're well, they see a bottle there, what's their natural instinct? So try not to do that, yeah? Uh, this is a four-year-old view of sweets. Uh, even for myself, uh, it's a bit difficult, which is the antihypertensive, which is aspirin, uh, which is a sweet, and uh, that's the unfortunate state of affairs. Uh, it does not help that pharmaceuticals as well as the industrial agents are, uh, agencies are actually making things worse. This you can see is our famous Gatorade and this is a win uh, uh, window cleaner. Okay. And of course these are shaped to attract children. Unfortunately this is actually a shampoo and this is a hand sanitizer. So uh, this, these are not, uh, you know, these are not uh, uh, imaginary stuff, this is real stuff here. Yeah. Again, uh, recycling don'ts, uh, as much as we want to be environmentally friendly. Um, uh, we had two cases of uh, salicylic poisoning from uh, um, the bottle broke, as uh, sometimes what happens. Then they put it into an antihistamine bottle for coccoranilose medicine. And then six months down the road, uh, the domestic helper was asked to administer flu medication. Okay, so there you go. And unfortunately, this is one of the stuff that can one swallow can kill, one pill can kill kind of thing. Um, we have had uh, near aspirations, but more of injections with cough, uh, kerosene. I mean, this can occur to us as well. The bottle broke, you put it into this, this uh, ubiquitous uh, bottle, leave it near the barbecue pit or anywhere near your you know, garage or something, uh, and then next time, you know, things might happen. Um, a survey done in the US, 38% uh, of poisoning involves the grandparents' medication. I added this slide simply because um, that's what I'm worried about, grandparents' medication. They tend to be powerful stuff, uh, sulfonyl ureas, antihypertensives, which might actually cause uh, a lot of morbidity and morbid, uh, mortality, in fact. Uh, again, most of them occur at home, so home is not exactly the safest place yet. This is a broad range, uh, can be found in most of the texts, but I just quickly classified antipsychotics, tricyclics, imidazolines, including of clonidine, antihypertensive, antiarrhythmics, antimalarious, which these two are fairly similar because of chloroquine effect, quinine effect, opioids, I've included antidiarrhea such as diphenoxylate over here. Sulfonylureas, theophylline, iron, and the non-pharmaceutical camphor, 
and the rest. Uh, this uh, photofilin is for what? Huh? You sometimes can buy uh, of the pharmacy. But changing it a little bit, uh, these are what you usually find in uh, internet websites as well as the textbook. But camphor specifically not so much a, a, a pill, but uh, this in the local context can be used for incense. And that we have seen actually uh, a few seizures from uh, such children. And I'll tell you why later. Methyl salicylate, uh, oil lamps. Uh, in US, death have been reported. Uh, Dubricane paste, which is uh, not found in Singapore. This is one of the lignocaine like. They're very long acting and then applied to babies, teething children. Uh, so they smother it and then they get mad hemoglobinemia and some of them have actually died because of that. Uh, imidazolin drops. Clonidine is used for ADHD and uh, uh, several other um, uh, issues, but eye drops uh, are imidazolin. I'll talk about that later. This one thankfully is not found in Singapore. GHB, uh, <laughs> one of my last people will talk about it. Uh, basically, uh, it's actually used as a date rape drug. Uh, but previously uh, used by bodybuilders, I have seen one case in overseas where the father was taking GHB as a bodybuilder. They believe that it increases growth hormone and they put it in a bottle. And of course, uh, if you put it in a bottle, yeah, the child got it. Um, so previously also, um, there are new polish removers uh, which actually uh, gets converted into GHB by the body as well as toy beads when they suck on it with a GHB poison. Uh, again, the child's perspective. Now, I've actually placed this under what are the things that can kill a child. And if you think about it, uh, this is what was what can be found easily even in Singapore and most of the Southeast Asian country. Uh, this is Camp 4. Okay, if you don't can't read it, this is it. And what does it look like? Uh, so it looks like sugar cubes, yeah? Uh, unfortunately, this is the one swallow can kill. Again, uh, this is in Thailand where they put kerosene into coke bottle. Uh, and, and even the proper packaging, I mean, seriously, it's, it's not difficult to see why children might be able to swallow this. Fuel, and uh, this is for camping. Okay? Uh, again, this is for camping as well. Serious. Uh, and this looks like cider, right? But it's actually oil. I mean, it's, it looks like the cider that we often have. And if you're a child, and uh, if you see this, uh, it's actually aromatic oils and, you know, you might just swallow it. Okay, be very consideration. Adding on new stuff, which is not quite now found in the internet or most textbooks. Uh, again, we live in a society with geriatric as well as uh, palliative care services are increasing. So we have fentanyl patches. So the thing is, once it's done, you throw it into the dustbin. Uh, the problem that is actually long-acting as well. So there have been cases where the child chews on it. Case reports of a baby. Uh, no, a toddler rolling on the grandma's bed, uh, it got attached and uh, became apneic only during resuscitation when they finally flipped it open, uh, flipped the child over for apnea incubated, they found the fentanyl patch there. So FDA actually recommends that uh, you flush it down the toilet. So we haven't had this kind of level of, uh, 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 I mean level of uh, awareness in Singapore yet. Uh, clonidine is not mentioned by FDA, but uh, of note, it can cause symptoms. It almost acts like uh, opioid poisoning in the, in the sense of the word. Okay. So general approach to the pediatric patient, every green circulation, uh, there's always a decon, uh, elimination, and fine antidote. Uh, pitfalls in management. Again, let's insert the nasal gastric tube because she's vomiting. If she's vomiting, then you know inserting the nasal gastric tube might make it worse. Uh, too drowsy, if you're too drowsy, you better protect the airway first before inserting the NG tube. So think about it before you do, do things like that. Uh, don't worry about this, these are all the antidotes. Again, they can be found in internet resources, I won't go through them. But just to emphasize that unfortunately, specific antidotes are infrequently available uh, for most instances, and usually the clinical effect is seldom dramatic, except for naloxone, for opioid poisoning. Uh, but main thing is supportive care. If I'm sure you do not know, check resources that you have and then support the child until then. Okay. Uh, for us, especially children with epilepsy, if they overdose on their own medicine, please don't give an antidote, then you bring them the refractory seizures. Uh, then you have to intubate them, give them phenobar, and uh, you know, it's just a, a very downward spiral because all the benzos you use won't uh, act until you finish, until the phenomenal uh, half-life is on. Okay, back to new and evidence-based in poisoning. Okay, uh, I like to go for case start, uh, start. Don't worry too much about this. Just in, if you don't want to answer, and knowing some of us, uh, you just tell me what you like to do. So you have a two-year-old, 
she thinks the granddaughter swallowed uh, one of her diabetic pills. Okay, the vital signs are normal. You've done a capillary blood glucose. It's five. Okay, the child is making smiling at you right now. So physical examination is normal. Uh, the pills are good design. So what would you do? Anyone quickly? Would you set a plug, start on a D10 uh, drip or D5 drip? We've seen. Yes, no? no? Okay. Basically, uh, sulfonyl ureas, the mechanism of action is actually increasing endogenous insulin secretion. Okay? So what it does is that if you, the more sugar you give, uh, parentally, you will need more, more insulin. So it becomes a very bad cycle. So it doesn't mean you don't have to do anything when they're in trouble. But, uh, just to quickly go through, the time of onset of sulfonyl is actually about between half an hour, up to delay, up to 16 hours in children. 80% right? within 4 hours though. Uh, but there was one case that uh, was reported delayed uh, hypoglycemia at 16 hours. So basically, even if the blood, capillary blood glucose is normal, you need to monitor them for at least 24 hours. Okay. So why if they're asymptomatic and uh, the capillary blood glucose is more than four? So you monitor regularly, allow feeding as per usual. Oral feeding, because of how the gastric emptying goes, allows. Uh, prevents rapid surges as opposed to IV, okay? So do not give dextrose unless symptomatic or the, the capillary blood glucose is low or venous blood glucose is low. So you watch carefully. Once you start and they are truly poisoned, uh, it's going to be a downward spiral, okay? So allow and encourage feeds. Uh, starchy stuff is possible because they delay the glycemic. Think about glycemic index uh, and probably you get an idea. So discharge only if there's no dextrose uh, or has been given for 24 hours. Why? Because if they are hypoglycemic, either biochemically or symptomatically, tachycardia, <coughs> new lipoclinic symptoms, um, you give them a bolus of D10, then consider starting an octreotide. Why octreotide? Uh, it antagonizes insulin release, basically. So the thing is that instead of going through that spiral, you go D10, D12.5, D3, uh, it becomes an endless cycle because the more you give, the worse it becomes. The other alternative is that you quickly give. Once it reaches between four to seven, start bringing down the, the, the glucose and then watch it. But this is slower. If you give octreotide, it might actually decrease the insulin secretion. Uh, so the dose, you can either give continuous infusion or they don't worry about the regimens. The regimens you can find on the internet, so I'm not too worried about that. Okay? So the trick is that, but the practical point of view if you use octreotide is, if they're hypoglycemic or symptomatic or biochemically, uh, you give dextrose, maintain them, then we not as necessary. But once you use dextrose, you start octreotide. But after you wean down the dextrose, you need to keep the octreotide for at least 24 hours first. Then once you slowly wean off the octreotide, after that, you stop it, wait 24 hours, then, then you allow the child to go back. So these are more practical point of views. Because if you stop halfway, there will be rebound effects uh, up and down. So this is a general trend. Other things are metformin. A metformin does not cause hypoglycemia. It causes lactic acidosis. Fortunately or unfortunately, uh, it's more uncommon in children to get significant toxicity. Uh, whereas we have seen, or I have seen uh, adults eating lactic acidosis from self-poisoning, basically, from uh, intentional uh, suicide. The newer ones are rarer, but pretty much they have the same uh, mechanism of action as sulfonylureas. Okay. Another case study, again, this is the one pill can kill. Uh, while eating chakwetel, for those foreign to us, uh, chakwetel is this uh, um, lard, pork fat kind of uh, noodles, which is really, really nice. Uh, and then the father remembers that he left the heart medicine. Unfortunately, if you are in Singapore long enough, you know that uh, all anti-hypertensive anti arrhythmics are referred to as heart medication, okay? Uh, next to the bucket of salted buttered popcorn from last night, okay? Two pills missing, and uh, the daughter points her mouth and starts smiling, okay? So what do you do? So you refer her to the emergency department, and the heart rate is 40, BP 70 over 35, basically hypotensive. But medication is normal, okay? So the ECG shows uh, sinus bradycardia, Potassium is 3.1, glucose is 15. What do you think she has ingested? Beta blockers. Okay, just a rough guide. Yeah? So the treatment is actually almost analogous, but uh, um, you know, the general approach is that how to differentiate between the two. They both get hypotension, they both get bradycardia. 
uh, propanolol and some others, because they have a bit of sodium blockade, uh, will cause increased white QRS. Less likely so in uh, calcium channel blockers. And again, because less likely to have calcium channel blockers actually neural protects. I mean, those who have um, brain injury patients, sometimes you neural protect with calcium SAH and such, they have neural protective effect. So if you see a very, very hypotensive patient with uh, normal mentation or normal, no, fairly normal mentation, think about calcium channel blockers as well. Uh, they tend to get seizures in propanol because it causes a, a blood brain barrier. They get low or normal glucose, whereas in uh, calcium channel they get high. And those severe ones tend to get high glucose. Okay? So uh, it can be normal or high for serum potassium and normal for low for calcium channel blockers. Okay? Three different classes. Dutyazem, Verbracomil, Nifedipine. I must add that Nifedipine doesn't fall into a class of bradycardia hypotension. They get reflex tachycardia instead. And death uh, goes according, uh, there have been some reports of death insurance based on Nifedipine itself. But uh, the ones that really cause a lot of trouble is Verbracomil. Okay, so pretty much that. Uh, usually not the child's medication for obvious reasons. We tend to avoid calcium channel blockers in children. So your SDTs, we rarely, rarely use uh, all this. Okay. Uh, again, one of the one doses can kill. Uh, so if even they are asymptomatic, you need to admit them, put out the plug. Uh, depending on the condition, you have to see how it goes. Sustain release for at least 24 hours. Yeah? All symptomatic should have ICU monitoring, stabilized and ICU monitoring. Um, I won't go through the specific because this is pretty much the same as for adults and children. Uh, so you divide into um, low BP, low heart rate, uh, is it likely verapamil or deutyazem, fluids, epinephrine, insulin, dextrose. Uh, we'll quickly talk about that. Glucagon, plus minus. Uh, calcium is more useful in beta blockers, but some people say yes, some people say no. Calcium salts, cardiac pacing, uh, and other stuff are like ECMO. Okay? Calcium channel blockers, again, manage your ABCs, check labs, IV fluids, iron troops, present, IV calcium, high dose insulin, intralipid. Intralipids have been uh, used for almost like collapsed patient asystolic and it has actually brought some patients back to life, uh, especially for beta blockers as well, uh, and ECMO as well. Okay, so these are the case reports for uh, five months, 30 months for high dose insulin euglycemic therapy. So the this don't worry about regimen. Basically, what happens? Remember that the insulin dose is much higher than DKA. So the practical point is that don't allow your nurses to fall back with the DKA protocol which they tend to because they continue. So this is one gram per kg followed by a D10, uh, you know, three to five mils. Or mid only if the hypo count is more than 22. But do remember that in uh, uh, calcium channel blockers, when they're very, very badly affected, they tend to have very, very high glucose anyway, right? But you have to monitor after that very closely, okay? Then this is followed by 0 0.5 to 1, depending. Uh, do remember once insulin stop, so potassium supplementation, have to watch very carefully. Once you stop the insulin, they will have rebound effect, they might hyperkalemic state. So only unless it's very, very low, then you would start uh, supplementation, okay? But most will not become hypoglycemic if monitored properly. Uh, the keyword is monitored. Huh? Okay, intralipid, this can be found in most. Uh, basically, it is not so much an intralipid as a 20% MCT. Uh, in my department, they actually restore the 20% from our TPM lab. Uh, so I don't have to pay the branding of it. Uh, because if you have a, a TPN lab, you can actually offer a cheaper alternative as well. Uh, again, this can be found in intralipid uh, dot org dot uh, okay. So other stuff are like uh, ECMO, percutaneous, and uh, IADP. Okay. So that's great. Any questions about custom channel blockers? If not, okay. Burning issues, yeah? Okay, your colleague rushes to you in the ED, intubated a five-year-old who was trapped for one hour in an enclosed burning room and found it unresponsive. While waiting for the urgent carboxyhemoglobin to run from that, it tells you that, no, the child is really acidotic, uh, despite uh, positive pressure ventilation. Okay, so he's wondering if you give by carb to improve the metabolic acidosis. Uh, what other quick tests would you do to assess the intubated child? And what other considerations uh, in, in the intubated child with persistent metabolic acidosis with a history of prolonged smoke inhalation. But do remember that, go back to the basics, yeah? Inhalation injuries, ATRS, exclude trauma. Uh, the thing is to think about is carbon monoxide. Cyanide, uh, now we are more in keeping with uh, this uh, as, as it goes on. And of course, the other stuff are like methemoglobinemia. 
Okay, for carbon monoxide, 15 to 20 is considered mild. Moderate is uh, above 21. Uh, severe is more than 40. Usually fatal is 60. Uh, note that cherry red skin, as in most textbooks, uh, is not a reliable finding. Okay, so once you say carbon monoxide, everything's hyperbaric. Okay, the hyperbaric is more for the long-term neurological sequelae, but even that is not so um, not doesn't stand a lot to the rigor of scientific uh, scrutiny. Uh. So basically, a lot of people say uh, yes, no, maybe. Uh, but the main thing is to resuscitate the patient first. Uh, that's the critical part. It takes time in an unstable patient you send to hyperbaric chamber. Uh, you might have more problems than you're solving. Okay. So, but why do we think about cyanide poisoning and smoke inhalation? Uh, meta analysis that cyanide is actually directly responsible for many more deaths than previously assumed, and cumulative with uh, carbon monoxide is worse than either individually. Again, source of cyanide, uh, as you can see, not difficult to find in our, our, our flats or our apartments or houses here. Okay, so they have found that uh, for both important determinants are directly correlated with probability of death and may dominate over cyanide as a cause of death in some fire victims and both potentially the toxic effects. Okay? Uh, again, depending on which study you are seeing and who you are looking at, uh, only one third to almost 90% actually have cyanide poisoning uh, in smoke inhalation. Uh, very likely, serum lactate is more than 8 without carbon monoxide poisoning or more than 10 with carbon monoxide. And they have a high venous. Cyanide is actually a Krebs cycle toxin. So what it does, it blocks, it prevents. So if you can't extract the oxygen, uh, you know your venous blood will be uh, almost analogous. Uh, so you can send cyanide levels, but uh, I can tell you that you'll come in like one or two weeks later. So. <laughs> okay, 100% oxygenation. Wean uh, for cyanide poisoning. Wean after 24, 48 hours. Wean uh, support, correct acidosis with bicarb, antidotes. So what are your antidotes? So traditionally for cyanide poisoning, uh, there's this cyanide kit. Uh, some of the hazmat or some of the industrial areas actually have this. So it's an amyl nitrate <coughs> where you inhale, it's pretty fast. Uh, IV sodium nitrite and IV uh, sodium thiosulfate. But um, for smoke inhalation specifically, uh, these two may not be the best. Simply because why? It's a double-edged sword, it causes high hypotension. Imagine if you're in smoke inhalation, you might have problems with that, okay? Again, it causes methemoglobinemia. And the population they are teaching are very young. Again, they have relative anemia. <coughs> Remember, it worsens if you have carbon monoxide, uh, carboxy hemoglobin. Now you add on methyl hemoglobinemia, then you're going to have lots of trouble. Okay? Then, of course, in all resuscitation, especially with burns with smoke inhalation, there's a lot of fluids involved. So you're going to dilute the blood further. So it's a... It's a so there is this, uh, which is vitamin B, basically, hydroxycobalamin. Uh, in some countries, especially the French and some North American uh, countries, the pre-hospital, if you're in smoke inhalation, they have altered conscious status, they give it themselves. The side effects are hypertension changes the color of the urine. Uh, hypertension is not a bad thing in young children without <coughs> poor abilities, uh, you know, so uh, it may be useful in trauma patients. But it may interfere with some of the blood tests, yeah? Uh, but it's synergistic with IV to sodium thiosulfate, but don't use the same line. Um, they'll precipitate, uh, so you have to use separate lines. Other causes of cyanide poisoning, uh, not so much in Singapore, uh, but you know, it's very difficult to capture and eat tapioca nowadays in Singapore. Uh, so uh, it's found in inadequately prepared, that means they haven't cooked it properly, uh, roots and leaves of tapioca uh, or cassava. Supplements, um, internet, you must be aware that in this day and age, Internet is a potential source of toxins. Uh. So they have this uh, Letrel, which is actually a anti-cancer drug. And what they've done is that you can, sell, you can actually buy it over the internet. And it's been shown to cause cyanide poisoning and some deaths have been reported. Uh. Some nail removers, but they have been... Uh, okay, quickly. Uh, again, as the bad day continues, 7 year old, previously healthy, uh, playing with sister last seen 30 minutes before her presentation. GCS is 8, respiratory 8, sets 90, BP a bit hypertensive, uh, not febrile, unpleasant odor, poor air entry, cat refused to the tree, pupils 2. Shortly the sister comes in. Any thoughts? Okay, I'm going to. I'm sorry, I'm forced to, to, to speed things up a little bit. Uh, basically, I'm going to quickly talk about uh, organic toxic poisoning in children. I just want to emphasize that it's very, very different from adults and children. 
In adults, you get the 3Ds, the, the more of the muscarinic. You get bron uh, you get bronchospasm, you get meiosis, you get diarrhea, incontinence. Uh, and the, all you remember about pneumonics in children, uh, sludge dumbbells are muscarinic, uh, they are not nicotinic. Okay, just to add on. Seizures are common in pediatric, but not in adults unless it's severe nerve agent poisoning or massive uh, organophosphate. So, in children, they present early. Uh, so, they tend to get, uh, yeah, are less common. Okay, so all your classicals. There's this pneumonia, which I don't think is really useful for, for nicotinic science, which is Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. I don't think it really helps. Huh? <laughs> okay, so, but they present different from in adults, more nicotinic, prominent CNS effect. MSK, they have actually paralysis, respiratory failure. Half of them have tachycardia instead of bradycardia. Okay, and then the rest are not as common as in adults. Okay, so management is pretty much this. Uh, look for rhabdomyolysis uh, if they have seizures. Uh, answer is atropin. Uh, there have been uses of some stuff like glycopyrrolate, but it doesn't cause the blood brain barrier. Diphenhydramine, some people have used it, uh, but less. Uh, but this one can cause uh, CNS depression as well, just have to watch. Oxims, not to be used as a single agent, uh, may be considered in dilithal uh, OPs, but controversial. Uh, so far, the trials actually feel, feel to show benefits, uh, especially, uh, I mean, potential harm as well. Adjunct magnesium has been shown to reduce hospitalization. Uh, use of, that means basically you compete with the OP. That means some people actually put down a prolonged blockade uh, to prevent them from it. Uh, sodium bicarbonate to aponize of that limited evidence, higher doses required. Um, I'm just going to quickly uh, show you guys. Uh, I mean, this is not a good slide, but uh, just to show you, this is Syria. I can't get organophosphate, but uh, to show you the illustrate, how is it different? They don't have a lot of frothing. They just act as if they are paralyzed. It's like your 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 um, G kind of thing. So what you see is just. I know it's a bit dark. But basically, they are just almost paralyzed, and that's pretty much about it. It's very different from the adult uh, cholinergic poisoning. Okay, you can download this from YouTube. I, I again, uh, those who have been through my courses uh, would know that uh, I do not uh, teach what's in the textbook if it's not relevant. Uh, so there are dumbbells and things that I work in pediatrics. Okay, last patient quickly. Uh, I need to put this in because this is fairly new. You're seeing a two-year-old presents with vomiting after playing beside the washing machine. Uh, mother noticed that there was some colored liquid on the shirt and could have bitten into a laundry pot she bought recently online. Now, this is from uh, a case report which I just transposed it. Huh? Mother actually report after 15 minutes, the child is lethargic, difficulty breathing, GTC, and then uh, lasting less than five minutes. Huh? So the child is fluctuating GCS, normal pupils, Vomitus in bilateral nests, no oral burns or lesions with intact gag, uh, coarse breath sounds and scattered uh, crackles and rock type. So what do you think has happened? And this is the x-ray from the case report. Okay, so basically the child was intubated and given bronchodilators and sent to ICU, just recovered with uh, supportive therapy after two days extubated and discharged well. Um, just to quickly go through, what the child actually took was a liquid detergent capsule. And uh, two deaths have been reported in the US in late 2013. So this one you can't find in the textbooks. Yeah. Symptoms that are GI vomiting, pulmonary, they have mild cough all the way to ARDS. Uh, after sent, uh, mental status seizures, they get esophageal burns and sometimes eye irritation as well as uh, corneal burns as well. And this is, uh, sorry, thank God for obvious reason. Uh, so you can see that this is the detergent pop. Okay. Yeah, no, I actually downloaded it. I was looking for it in Singapore. Uh, whether it's apparent or not. So I went to Google it, and uh, the only place I can find, and this is from a website in Singapore, uh, this is a father suggesting, looks like food. Lah. Okay, I have seen it at Cold Storage, Holland, uh, Holland B, Holland Village is a place in Singapore, but Amazon is, I got mine from Amazon. So in this day and age, uh, you can find it anywhere. Okay, take home message, uh, so beware, it's supportive. And why this happens, it depends on your capsule. Some are very alkaline, uh, but some reported have neutral pH, so they think it's safe for children. But unfortunately, I think what is the, the effect is some of that surfactant uh, destroys the lung surfactant and causes a lot of harmony involvement as well. So that's uh, the reason why uh, they have very presentation as well. Take home message, uh, how do you manage a poison child? Again, back to your basics, um, your support and questions later. Okay.